Welcome to Winter Talks About Baseball Statistics, where I'm just going to talk about some basics of baseball in a quiet, calm voice. If you know about baseball, it may be pretty straightforward and repetitive to you. If you don't know about baseball, well, it might be a lot of details. But either way, hopefully you can close your eyes, settle down, and listen to my voice to relax. Don't worry about the details. Just take a deep breath, let it out slowly, and we'll start. Baseball statistics basically can be split into three easy categories. Batting statistics, fielding statistics, and pitching statistics. Figuring out a lot of the basic statistics isn't too complicated. It just takes some simple arithmetic, and I'll talk about how we do that. There are definitely some more complicated stats that take more work than that, but we're not going to get into them. Why not? Well, I don't entirely get the math behind them, so we're going to stick with the simple ones. Only a couple of statistics are really applicable to all players, now that the designated hitter is in effect in both leagues. Those are two pretty simple ones. First, games played. This one is very straightforward. It's just the number of games a player has appeared in. Similar, but not quite the same thing, is the number of games started. This one is more important to pitchers because some pitchers will start a game, pitch several innings, and then another pitcher will come in from the bullpen to take over. But some players at other positions will see substitutions too. Whether they're coming in off the bench as a pinch hitter, or a pinch runner, or as a defensive replacement in the late innings, or to replace an injured player. But if they had their choice, most players would want to be out there all nine innings. Now, as I said, Baseball statistics split up into three categories otherwise, and we're going to start with the offense. Now, a lot of statistics in baseball are just counting numbers. Things like the number of hits, walks, strikeouts. These are all very straightforwardly counted, and baseball loves compiling them. The list goes on and on. Every game leads to a big pile of statistics being brought together, and people who are very good at what they do can tell a lot about a player by those numbers. Let's take a look at the most basic ones, which might be a little more complex than they originally sound. The two statistics that start everything sound pretty similar to start. These are plate appearances and at-bats. Now there's a little difference between the two. Plate appearances are the simplest. It's every time the player has gone to plate during a game and faced off against a pitcher. Every time they step up, that's a plate appearance. Now, how that visit to the plate ends, that's what defines the difference between a plate appearance and an at-bat. If it ends with a hit, a strikeout, or an error, that's an at-bat. But if it turns out to be a walk, a hit by a pitch, or a sacrifice hit, that's a plate appearance, but not an at-bat. There are a few other situations that might show up, and we'll discuss those later. But, so the numbers are always pretty close, but not exactly the same. Now, a lot of statistics are based around the results of a plate appearance. The most basic one is a hit. That just means the batter put the ball in play and they reached base. There are a few situations where a batter can hit the ball and reach base and not get credit for a hit. Two of them are relatively common. 
One is if the fielder throws to get another runner out. That's called a fielder's choice, and the batter will get an at-bat, but won't be credited for a hit. The other, slightly less common situation, is if a fielder makes a mistake on the play. They drop it when they're fielding, or they make a bad throw, or something else that allows the batter to reach base. That would be counted as an error on the defender, and that means that the batter doesn't get credit for a hit either. Hits aren't the only way a trip to the plate can end either, and baseball tracks all of the options. Strikeouts are always an important statistic, as are walks, which allow a batter to get on base without a hit. Sometimes those walks are accidental, but sometimes it will be an intentional walk, and those are kept track of separately too. Batters can also earn a free trip with a hit by pitch. Ouch. One of the final ways that a plate appearance can end is with a sacrifice hit. This is when there's a runner on base, and the batter will get an out in a way that lets the runner advance, or even score a run. It's an out, but it helps the team, so it's not exactly counted against the batter quite as strongly as another out. Much like all outs aren't created equally, not all hits are the same either. Baseball keeps track of how far a batter gets on a hit, classifying each type of hit separately. A single, a double, a triple, or a home run. They're all tallied up and kept track of. Once they have all these numbers, they can work out another statistic. Total bases. This one is pretty simple. Just how many bases the batter got on their hits. One base for a single, two bases for a double, three bases for a triple, and yeah, you guessed it, four bases for a home run. Once we've got those numbers, then we can get into some of the more analytical stats. The first one is batting average. That one is very simple to calculate. You take the number of hits a batter has, and then divide it by the number of at-bats they have. It's always given as a three-digit number after a decimal point. So, for example, let's say we've got a batter who has six hits in 20 at-bats to start out the season. Simple enough. Six divided by 20 means that their batting average is 300. That's a pretty respectable batting average for a hitter. Around 250 is decent enough, 300 is good production, and over 350 is really good. The mythical mark for a season is a batting average over 400. No one has managed that in Major League Baseball since 1941 when Ted Williams did it. Over 80 years, and the best anyone has done in a full season was 390 by George Brett in 1980. In the past 20 years, only one batter has hit over 370 in a full season, Ichiro Suzuki. So 400 is a pretty tough mark to beat. Now, the next statistic that gets used a lot is called on-base percentage. That one takes a little more work to calculate. You take the number of hits a player has, add in their walks and their hits by pitches, and then you divide that by their plate appearances, which is their at-bats, walks, hit by pitches, and sacrifice hits combined. So let's take our imaginary batter from before. He had six hits in 20 at-bats. Let's say he also had three walks, one hit by a pitch, and a sacrifice fly. That means he reached base 10 times in 25 plate appearances. A little bit of math, and he's got an on-base percentage of 400. That would put him at number six in the major leagues this season as the time I'm writing this. The highest on-base percentage for a season in baseball is an incredible 609, held by Barry Bonds in 2004. How did he get on base that much? 
Well, he was known for hitting a lot of home runs, setting a league record at 73 back in 2001. Because of that, a lot of teams would walk him intentionally. In 2004, he had 120 intentional walks, the most anyone else other than him had ever received in one season was 45 by Willie McCovey. McCovey's record stood for 33 seasons, but now he's only fourth on the list, with Bonds holding the top three seasons. Let's just keep Barry Bonds' name in mind as we look at our next statistic, slugging percentage. That one rates how hard the batter is hitting the ball effectively. For that, we want to look at our total bases that the batter has racked up, and then divide that by their number of at-bats. Remember, don't use their full plate appearances. It's a pretty simple formula once we've added up the bases. Let's say that our imaginary batter is showing some power early on. Their six hits are three singles, two doubles, and a home run. Three bases for the singles, four bases for the doubles, two each, and four bases for the home run. That means they've piled up 11 total bases so far. Divide that into their 20 at-bats, and their slugging percentage is a respectable 550 so far. Again, good enough for them to be ranked in the top 10 in Major League Baseball this season. On a historical register, we're back to Barry Bonds who holds the Major League Baseball record with a slugging percentage of 863 in 2001. Hitting all those home runs helps. Before him, the record was held by another name you might have heard of, Babe Ruth, who had a slugging percentage of 847 in 1920 and held the record for eight decades. Well, sort of. The statistic for slugging percentage wasn't invented until 1964, but Babe Ruth got his recognition in retrospect. Once you've got those two numbers figured out, it's very easy to figure out the next statistic people use, which is called OPS. And the way it works is right there in the name. It's a batter's on-base percentage plus their slugging percentage, OPS. We've already done the work for our hypothetical batter. An on-base percentage of 400 and a slugging percentage of 550. Add those together and you get a very respectable 950 OPS. Again, good enough to put them in the top 10 this season in baseball. You won't be surprised to hear that the historical record belongs to Barry Bonds again. Those walks in 2004 gave him an OPS of 1422. He holds a second place record as well, with Babe Ruth holding third place. Now, there's a few more statistics that come up, talking about things that happen after the batter reaches base. The most basic of these is runs. Simple and straightforward, it's how many times the batter scored a run. Easy. Another one is runs batted in, which is a little bit more complex. The short version is simple. It's how many runs scored from the results of their plate appearance. Runner on third and you bring them in with a single or a sacrifice fly? That's an RBI. Runner on and you hit a home run? That's two RBIs. One for the base runner, and one for yourself scoring. It does get a little more complicated in that there are situations where you might have a run score and not be credited with an RBI. If the other team commits an error that would have ended the inning, you don't get an RBI for that. If you hit into a double play, you don't earn an RBI for that either, even if someone scores, as if hitting into a double play wasn't bad enough by itself. You also won't earn an RBI if you hit into a fielder's choice, where the fielder might have thrown to get the runner out before they scored, but decided to get you out instead. After all of that, the only real other basic statistic for a base runner is about steals. 
This comes in two flavors, and they're pretty self-explanatory. A stolen base, where you successfully steal, and caught stealing, where you're thrown out attempting to steal. These are used to calculate your base stealing percentage. Stolen bases divided by your number of attempts. 20 successful steals and 5 caught stealing would mean you have 25 attempts and a base stealing percentage of 80%. Simple. Now, on top of all of these, there are a lot more complex statistics. A common one is called OPS Plus, or Adjusted OPS which takes a player's OPS and compares it to the average for the league and for the stadiums they played in, so that the average OPS plus that season is a score of 100, and an OPS plus of 150 would be 50% better than the average. This has some uses, where you can compare players across the history of baseball by accounting for the quality of their competition. For example, Barry Bonds' OPS of 1381 in 2002 might seem to be only a hair better than Babe Ruth's OPS of 1379 in 1920, but comparing their OPS plus shows that Bonds had a 268 to Ruth's 255. Still not a huge difference, but more impressive than the pure numbers might show. I will say though that it takes a whole lot of math to work out these numbers, so I'm not really going to go into how to work it all out. Just knowing how to read them and compare them is important. That covers a lot of bases for offensive statistics. For a little bit of a breather, let's look at defensive stats, just because it's a little simpler before we dive into pitching. Fielding basically has very few statistics to it. When it comes to counting them down, the three important counting statistics are putouts, assists, and errors. The first two are very straightforward. If you touch the ball during a play and someone gets an out, you receive credit for an assist. If you physically get the out, by tagging a runner, stepping on a base, or catching a fly ball in the air, you receive a put-out. It's pretty simple. Errors are the only part of it that takes a little bit of a subjective call, but it's not our decision. In every stadium, they have someone called the official scorer, and they basically keep track of how all the plays in the game take place. When a player makes a mistake, they will say the player committed an error, and sometimes people don't always agree with what counts as an error or who gets credit for it. For example, if a player misses a catch because they were too late getting to the ball, some people might say it's an error, or just that it wouldn't have been realistic for the player to catch it and shouldn't be punished. If a throw is missed, some people might disagree if the error should be on the player that threw it or the player who didn't catch it. But the official scorer has final say even if they sometimes go back and revise their opinion after watching the play again. With that, you can calculate a player's fielding percentage very easily. Their putouts and assists added together, and then divided by the sum of their putouts, assists, and errors. Some players will go hundreds of innings without an error, so a perfect fielding percentage is not impossible in baseball but it is always impressive. Very good players will have their fielding percentages in very high ranges like 99.7 or higher. Again, there are more complicated statistics, things like range factor, which calculates how far a player can go to field a ball, but they get into a lot more esoteric requirements and that's not really why we're here. So instead, we'll move on to pitching. Let's get into it. The most basic stat there is for a pitcher is the number of innings pitched. 
it may look a little weird to look at their numbers because they aren't always round numbers, depending on how many outs they got before they left a game. If they pitch four full innings and then get one out in the next inning before they leave, the statistics will credit them with 4.1 innings. Getting two outs will say 4.2 innings. For three outs, they would get credit for the full inning. This looks a little odd, and you may have to remember to adjust when you're calculating some statistics, because it may say 4.1 innings, but you need to calculate for four and one-third innings. The next counting stat is runs. Simply put, how many batters did they face that were able to come around and score a run? The run is always charged to the pitcher who was pitching when that batter reached base, even if that pitcher is not in the game anymore. Runs can be broken down into two groups, earned runs and unearned runs. Unearned runs are runs that are only able to score because of an error committed by the defense, such as a base runner that would have been out except for an error, or a run that scores after an error that could have been the third out of the inning for a pitcher. Every other run is an earned run. With this in mind, we can calculate one of the other main stats for a pitcher their earned run average. It's a little bit more complicated because it indicates how many earned runs a pitcher would have allowed if they pitched nine innings. The way it's calculated is to divide their earned runs by their innings pitched and then multiply the result by nine. For example, if we had a pitcher with 20 earned runs and 60 innings pitched, you divide 20 by 60 for 0.333 repeating, and you multiply it by 9 to get 3. Again, this would be a top 10 pitcher in the majors this season. This is a solid number for a pitcher. Usually a number under 3.5 is solid, and under 3 is very good. Starting pitchers are expected to see slightly higher ERAs than a relief pitcher due to how they're used in a game. Much like how OPS Plus is used to adjust for the quality of the league and compare players across eras, there's a version of ERA used for similar purpose called, and you might not be surprised, ERA Plus. It's read the same way, where a score of 100 is a league average, and a score of 150 is 50% better than average. The MLB record for a season is from 2000 when Pedro Martinez had an ERA plus of 291, which is pretty amazing. Another common stat for pitchers is to look at their wins and losses. Now, losses are easy to calculate. If the run that gave the other team the lead for the last lead change was a batter you faced, you're in line for the loss. Wins can be a little more complicated since there's a few more factors. Generally, it's whoever was the pitcher that got the last out of the inning before their team took the lead for the final time. But there are other factors. For example, a starting pitcher has to pitch at least five full innings to be eligible for a win, no matter if their team has the lead. It can be a little rough. Start a game and pitch four innings and you're eligible for a loss, but not the win. But baseball isn't always merciful. Wins and losses aren't always the best way to evaluate a pitcher because there are so many other factors that influence if they receive a win or a loss. Like if your team is scoring runs, or if another pitcher comes in and loses the lead that you left with. So it's important to take wins and losses with a grain of salt when evaluating someone. If you don't get a win or a loss, there's still a few other stats you might rack up. For a pitcher that comes out of the bullpen with his team leading, if they pitch and record an out, they can earn a hold. If you get the last out of the game and your team wins, you can earn a save. 
but these aren't available in every situation. You have to be in what's called a save situation. A save situation is when your team has a lead of three or fewer runs, or if you have the potential tying run at bat or on deck, waiting to bat, or if you come in to pitch in relief and pitch at least three innings. Saves are a very prized stat, with elite closers being pursued by plenty of different teams. There are a few more counting statistics that apply to all pitchers, and they are pretty easy to keep track of. The number of hits they allow, the number of walks they give up, and the number of strikeouts they give. All of these can be used to calculate other statistics that help us evaluate pitchers. One basic statistic is called WHIP, which stands for Walks and Hits Per Inning Pitched. Again, it's very simple to calculate. Just add up the number of walks and hits and divide by the number of innings. A pitcher with a WHIP below one is a very good pitcher. Other stats are similarly simple. Hits per nine innings, walks per nine innings, and strikeouts per nine innings. Just much like ERA, divide the statistic by the number of innings pitched and multiply by nine. Easy to work out. Again, there's a lot of other advanced statistics out there like a version of earned run average that's calculated with regards to your player's defense to indicate how you pitched independent of their fielding, and some very complex stats that center around estimating how much value a player brings to their team as opposed to a hypothetical replacement player, involving a lot of complex math and calculations that I'll admit I don't fully understand, and it's almost certainly outside the scope of this audio. So, I think we've covered a lot of the basics. I hope you learned something. And I hope listening to my voice helped relax you a little bit. And I hope you have a wonderful time zone, wherever you are. Thank you for listening.